Dr. Sinclair, can you tell me how best it is to treat IIH? Yes, yeah, so we have really three approaches for how we try and manage our patients. The first approach is lifestyle man management, which really includes weight loss, and we try and help people to talk about weight loss and to work out ways to lo lose weight. Second approach is by using tablets and medications. And then the third approach is in people who have very severe IIH with severe decline in their eyes, in which case we might think about surgery. So if we go through those one by one, first of all, if we talk about the tablets that we might use for IIH, well, the most commonly prescribed tablet is acetazolamide. And I think two years ago now, 2014, so three years ago now, a large trial came out from the American group, which was the biggest randomized trial that's ever been run in IIH, so a really landmark trial, which has shown us that there is some evidence for prescribing um, acetazolamide for people with mild to moderate visual loss in IIH. So a lot of physicians would prescribe that tablet. But we also know that that tablet can make people feel a little bit unwell sometimes. It can give you side effects of tingling around the mouth, tingling in the fingers. It can sometimes make people feel a bit nauseated and not wanting to eat. So not everybody's going to be able to tolerate acetazolamide, particularly at, at very high doses, which is what the American trial was using. So sometimes it's not possible to use that tablet. There are other tablets which are much more rarely prescribed for IIH. These typically are water tablets, which people, um, you know, some of, the, of our patients may describe using frusamide or coamylafruse or bumetanide. So these are some of the water tablets that are used. And again, we don't really have a grasp on how useful they are because we haven't run big trials and we haven't really even run basic laboratory research to tell us how useful they are to treat IIH. But what about when vision is really badly declining and we need to do something more urgent? Perhaps Ms. Mullins, do you want to mm. talk a bit about that? So what we need to do when we know the vision's at risk is we need to protect the vision. And there's a number of different approaches that gets used in the UK and around the world. One of them is um, what we say is CSF diversion in the form of a shunt. So that would be a shunt placed either within the brain running into the tummy cavity or in the back round into the tummy cavity would be the more common types of shunt. And typically it gets put in as an emergency. Uh, it is a neurosurgical procedure and the majority of people are put to sleep for that procedure. And that buys us a good amount of time for us to then employ some of the other things such as weight modification to put the disease into remission. Another surgical approach is optic nerve sheath fenestration. This is a procedure that is done on either one eye or both eyes, where they create a little opening or a little window within the sort of optic nerve sheath to let the fluid out. And again, this is another procedure that protects the vision and buys us time. With any surgical procedure, there are complications, and you'd need to speak to your actual individual surgeon to run through some of those complications and weigh up the risks and the benefits of the surgery. It sounds like the, the main reason to, to treat IAH is to preserve eyesight. I think that's one of our key management mm -hmm. principles. The other management principle is to really reduce the headache disability. As well, yeah. yeah. Okay. If we just focused on, on, on the vision side, I think we would leave a lot of patients who had very long-term disabling headaches who needed that helping as well. There's another procedure that's being used um, more and more internationally, and that's venous sinus stenting. Um, you may have you heard of that procedure or have you read about it at all? Oh, no. no. So that's a procedure sometimes we see on the brain scans that some of the veins of the brain are collapsed down or compressed in particular areas of the brain and they can measure whether that, that compression or that collapsing of the veins is causing a problem with the blood flow and causing high pressure. And then some of the centres are starting to put in little stents, which is a bit like a spring to open up the vein to help the blood flow better. And it's a very early procedure, not all centres are doing it, and we don't really know enough about it in terms of how successful it is in the long term to know whether we should be doing it more or whether we shouldn't be doing it. So we're waiting for studies to be done to really guide us to say whether that's a, a better procedure than the ones we've already are, are doing. But certainly with all of the procedures, like we were mentioning, they, they can often be quite short term. So a lot of them, a lot of the procedures, whether it's an optic nerve sheath fenestration or a shunt procedure, or indeed a, a stent, they may at some point stop working and then they may need to be redone. And that, that uh, failure rate 
is variable between the different procedures and between the different surgeons, but it's certainly a factor that we take into account because we know that it often isn't a long-term strategy and therefore we need to try and get the IIH to settle while those surgical procedures are still working. And that often comes back to thinking about how we can modify weight again. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's not a straightforward thing with surgery. Thank you. Yeah. So sometimes our patients ask us a bit more about Diamox and they ask us things about, well, what sort of doses do you start on and things like that. And really, when we look around the UK, people have different ways of starting it, whether they titrate up or they start at one gram. And really, there's no prescribed way in how we do it. And, and as Dr Sinclair mentioned, the actual side effects of medication often limit how much we can give people. So in the IIHTT, the treatment trial from 2000. 14, they were using doses up to four grams, but the majority of people only tolerated a gram. In our own Birmingham study, we found nearly up to 44% of patients actually discontinued Diamox because they didn't like the side effects. Um, so often Diamox can be a, a difficult tablet for some of our patients to take. One of the questions we get from long-term users of Diamox is why um, are my uh, bloods not being checked when I'm on the treatment? And quite often we, we talk about that. And when you look at the manufacturer recommendations, they recommend that it should be checked, but they give no recommendation on when. So if you're concerned about it, I think you should ask your doctor and say, could you just check my kidney function? On the other hand, it's quite rare. Mm. So they, they use that drug very frequently at very high doses in the American studies, and there was no significant issues with the, with the high dose. So we don't tend to do routine monitoring in our clinic unless people or come to us asking for it, or patients are complaining of you know, a symptom, like they're feeling unwell, and we think, oh, could that be related to the drug? We might check it. So we don't tend to organise it routinely, but others around the country may do.